Okay, hi guys, welcome back to the Japan Archives, episode 54B. So we're going to be continuing the story of the first emperor this week. How are you doing this week, Heather? I know before I hit record, you said you were a bit sleepy, but apart from that... I'm pretty good, I think. Yeah, it, pretty good. A little sleepy, but other than that, rolling along pretty okay. It was a um, nice weekend. It was the three-day holiday. I forget what the holiday was yesterday, but we went for a nice hike in the mountains and it was lovely. Beautiful fall day, leaves are falling, summer's still hanging around though, so it was really lovely. How about you? How are you doing? I'm doing good. haven't really gone anywhere, if I'm honest. Case is going up a bit again in Tokyo, so staying home. So yeah, not really much for me to say about me this week. <laughs> Sometimes it's not a bad thing though. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So let's jump into the episode then. So please remind me, where did we leave off then last week? Had we had a battle and then we met, oh, we met someone in the mountain and they, no, that was before that. So I think, oh yeah, we had the sword and we had a battle and mm, someone yes. died and all of that good stuff. Well, not good stuff, mostly some good stuff. All of that good stuff, sure thing. Now, before I jump back into it, I do want to quickly say that reading through my notes today before we started recording, I wanted to double check my notes against the books. And I did come across a mistake in the last episode, so quickly want to rectify that. So we talked about the guy called Nagasune Hiko and how he attacked Emperor Jima and his forces and ultimately caused the death of one of the emperor's brothers with the arrow in the hand. Now that is all correct. However, I I got a bit confused reading the books later on. And when I said that the emperor's forces then managed to destroy Nagasune Hiko and his men, that is where I got a bit confused. So for now, Nagasune Hiko and his people have not been killed and are still alive to fight for another day. So you're with me, Heather? Yes. On with the show then. Like Heather just said, if you recall last week, we ended up with the Emperor and his men falling into a deep sleep after they saw a bear in the mountains. However, they were then saved by the man known as Takakuriji with his heavenly sword that was brought down to him. So we're going to continue on immediately from that moment. So after this, the Emperor decrees that they would make their way inwards into the land, trying to traverse through the mountains, of which they did sadly have to admit defeat. They could find no easy way to get through the mountains and get further into the heartland of Japan. And so that night they decided to go to sleep and another divine message came in, this time not to Takakuriji, but to the emperor himself. The sun goddess spoke to him directly in his dream, um, saying that she would help guide him onwards and send down to him a divine bird, a crow, known as the Yatagarasu. After he awoke, he saw the bird appear from on high to lead them onwards and the emperor was very much happy that this was happened because once again he was being given a sign to show that he was destined to unify all Japan because the gods were still on his side. I saw your face light up when I mentioned the bird. What was that about? Karasu is is crow, isn't it? And so he's got the garasu because it's sound changed, but... Because I was going to ask you, what kind of bird was it? But as soon as you said that and you said crow, I was like, ah, it, ah, that's, a, that's, I like that very much indeed. <laughs> and the yata part of it relates to the counter, the number eight, how it turns to yatsu. The yata means eight. There's a few different interpretations. Some is like, some describe it as an eight span crow in length. Some people say it was a crow with an eight foot neck, which is a terrifying Ooh image in my mind oh, um so i'm gonna go with it being an eight span crow because i prefer a large crow to the idea of a giraffe horrible crow thing anyway at this time ah! <laughs> that would be can you imagine you turn around and you see that flying down to you from the air like Rah! you would run you would run. run as fast as you can my goodness so this has happened, the crow has arrived, and at this time there was a man known as He no Omi, or I suppose if you want to translate it, it would come out as the Minister of the Sun. And he was actually 
in the book, it says that he was an ancestor to the Otomo house, which was the clan of the Imperial Guard. That aside, it was this man who led the troops in following the Yatagarasu until they reached a village known as Ukechi. And after they had arrived here, due to the loyalty of Hino Omi in following this bird, the emperor decides to give him a new name of Michi no Omi, or the Minister of the Road, because of the route they took to follow the bird. And as a quick aside, like I said, we're using different texts for this, and this particular event is purely mentioned in the Nihongi. The Kojiki makes no mentioning of this particular event happening. After they've arrived at Ukichi, they decide to stay there for a while. The emperor wanting to learn the names of the rulers of this area. And as it turned out, the two people in this area who rule it are known as Ukeshi the Elder and Ukeshi the Younger. The emperor decides to summon them to him, but only the younger of the two brothers decides to come. But when he arrives, he does bring him a tale of his older brother. I kind of find it interesting that the book at this point calls like the brothers Ukeshi the Elder and Ukeshi the Younger. I get very much Pliny vibes from this. Hmm. With Pliny the Elder and Pliny the Younger. Maybe it's different kanji though. Oh, maybe. Maybe the, their father's name their father's name was Ukeshi and he really liked the name, so he just kind of kind of kept passing it on mm, maybe so the younger brother arrives with news of his older brother saying emperor jimu my older brother is preparing to attack you saying that once he learned that the emperor jimu was had arrived in their army had arrived in their area he quickly gathered an army which he then decided to hide from the emperor after doing that, he then built a banquet hall, his plan being to invite the emperor to this hall for a lavish feast and then attack him upon arrival there. The emperor now knowing of this treachery, he sent his minister Michi no Omi to the elder brother, forcing him to admit what he was going to do. And in forcing the elder brother to admit this, he then takes him into his own banquet in hall where he is then crushed to death and after being crushed to death, they then take his body outside to behead him, and it is said that the blood from the beheading was enough to flood the area up to the, your ankles. Huh. All right. It's a lot. It's a lot of blood. I, 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 I'm I just really putting it out there. Don't have anything. S sounds to add. unfeasible. It. I. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm. I hope it's unfeasible. That's just horrifying. Also, really sad that he got. Oh. Ooh. So after this, in the aftermath, the remaining younger brother, I suppose almost ironically in a way, he throws his own banquet to actually welcome the emperor and such. And during this festival, during this banquet, sorry, they do eat a lot of meat and sake. And many songs were sung, it is said. Yeah, that much sake, yeah, there were going to be songs sung. They were definitely going to be singing. After such an extravagant feast, the Emperor Jimu then wished to inspect the nearby area of Yoshino. Just to remind you, we are... where are we? We're in the Nara area hmm. in Japan right now. And so the Emperor headed onwards to Yoshino, where upon his arrival, he came across a well where a spirit popped out to say hello. It turned out the name of the spirit was Wihikari in the Nihongi, or... If you're reading the Kojiki, they give him the name of Ihika. And it said that this was a local deity in the area. Soon after, as the emperor carries on walking along, he comes across a rock and from which a deity comes, another deity comes forth, calling themselves the child of someone called Iha Oshiwake. This spirit themselves called Iha Oshiwaku no Ko. So basically their name is the child of Ishi Oshiwaku. He moves on a little bit more, and he comes across a fisherman. The Nihongi here does not give a name for this person, but the Kojiki gives him the name of Nie Motsu no Ko. The Nihongi stating that they were a child of Nihei Motsu. So again, this deity's name is the child of Nihei Motsu. Interestingly enough, it's said that this particular deity was the ancestor of the cormorant keepers of Ata. And historically, the cormorants were used to catch fish by fishermen in the day. So he is the ancestor of Japanese fishermen. 
and in oh i forget which prefecture it's in they still use they do the the cormorants to go fishing uh they have a, a festival it's really i've seen it on like the the thing uh, i've seen it on tv where they they show the the birds fishing and it's really interesting i, I feel a little uneasy because the the birds kind of are not able to eat the fish because of the they have a, a cord tied around their neck. So it's not tight, but it's enough that they can't actually swallow the fish, but it's still, it's a little, I feel a little not happy for the birds. Although they're trained, but I still don't feel quite happy for the birds. Have you seen it before? I've seen, I have seen it before on TV, but I didn't realize they had the cord around their neck. I thought it was more, they've somehow trained the birds to you provide the fish and then I give you a portion of the fish, which seemed strange to me at the time because the bird could just eat the fish straight away. But I suppose because of the use of the cord, they know that unless I get catch the fish, I won't be able to eat anything. So it makes a little bit more sense now to me, but it does feel a little bit cruel. I'm going to just double check really quick to make sure that I'm not like, I thought I saw it, but I could be wrong. Ah, yeah, here you go. Yeah, you can actually see in this picture, it looks like there's a Something tied around his neck. I want to send this to you. Oh, yeah, I see it. Yeah, I see it. It's, it, I mean, it's obviously a practice that has worked because they still do it, but it still feels a little cruel. No? Yeah, I, I, I don't have a, a, a really nice feeling to see the, the, the cord wrapped around mm. the neck. So, it, I mean, it's, uh, it's one of those things that, anyway, cormorant fishing. So that's where it came from, according to the Nihongi. I'm going to say mythologically, because a lot of mm. these things are kind of more legendary than based on facts. But, you know, cormorant fishing, we should make an episode on that and look into it, maybe. But he's found these three deities, which, I don't know, reading the books, they kind of seem almost thrown in there because they have served no purpose. They don't do anything. They just go, hello, I am me. And then we never hear from them again. But... Mm. After he has met these three deities, the emperor proceeds to climb to the top of Mount Takakura. And from there, he can look down upon all the surrounding lands that he has yet to unite, and he can see all of his en enemies. And it's said that from his vantage point, he can see a group of 80 bandits, an army of women, an army of men, as well as the armies of a man known as Shiki the Elder. And the emperor realizes that he and his men would eventually need to subdue all these people so they can not only unify the area, but then move on to unifying the rest of Japan. And so that night, as the emperor slept once more, a divine message came to him from the sun goddess, Amaterasu. It said that she instructed him to construct 80 food platters from the earth gathered from Mount Kagu, as well as constructing 80 sacred jars. And using those to make sacrifices to the deities above, should he have done this, then his enemies were surely to be defeated. Funnily enough, it said that as he awoke the next morning, Ukeshi the Younger approached the emperor with the exact same idea. And so the empress hearing the tale, hearing the idea once more, made him even more determined to fulfill this quest set to him by the sun goddess. The only problem was how were they going to get through the enemy lines to get the items they needed. Ukeshi the younger is instructed to go by the emperor and so he decides to take along with him someone known as Shihi Netsuhiko. Together they disguise themselves as old people. One disguised as an old man, another disguised as an old lady and off they trotted towards the enemy to try and get to Mount Kagu. Fortunately for them, it said that their disguises did work and they were given, they were allowed to pass through the lines of their enemy without being subject to too much scrutiny. And so they quickly moved past, moved on, climbed the mountain, gathered the earth and returned to the emperor. After this, the platters were made as well as the sacred jars. And so next, the emperor moved to make something known as ame for the platters and he wanted to make sake for the jars with one goal in mind. He said that if he could make the ame without using water, then it would show that he would be successful in the fights to come in the future. 
And similarly, after he was going to make the sake, he said that he would submerge the jars in the river. And if all the fish were to rise to the top of the river drunk and be washed down river, then again it would show that he would be successful in the fights to come. I'm sure you know the results of this, as he did go on to unify all of Japan. The ame and the sake did just what the emperor hoped. Sake did he make to make all the fish drunk? <laughs> I mean, how much how much sake would you need to change the consistency of a river? A lot, probably. Do you get fish drunk? Well, he had at least he had at least eighty jars. Hmm. I'm just assuming they're big jars. Very very big jars, like the crow could drink out of them. Exactly, with his giant eight foot neck. Oof. Now, as an aside, I find it interesting here that. Initially, he was told to make these things as sacrifices to the gods, but then he, it's almost perhaps like the author forgot that that was the purpose of this because he doesn't sacrifice them to the gods. He makes some food and he makes some fish drunk. And at no point does he actually sacrifice any of these items to the gods. So whether the author forgot or whether the emperor decided he didn't actually need to do what the sun goddess asked of him, not entirely sure. Leave that to your own thoughts and opinions. So he's made these sacrifices in quotation marks. And a few weeks have passed. And so the emperor decides to move and attack. It said the first group he attacks is a group of 80 bandits that were located on Mount Kunimi. And he, on the whole, he does defeat them mostly, but some do still remain. The emperor wanting to completely annihilate this clan, he instructs Michino Omi to invite the remaining band to a banquet in which he planned to capture them. However, in the end, none were actually captured and all were killed. After getting the remaining bandits drunk, the minister, Michino Omi, decided to slaughter them all, which is not too dissimilar to what Ukeshi the Elder was actually planning to do to Emperor Jimu when he also invited him to his own banquet. So I guess he was taking an he was taking notes from how his enemy were treating him, perhaps. This entire group has now been killed, so the Emperor decides to turn his attention to a another bandit bandit group led by two princes known as Shiki the Elder and Shiki the Younger. I sense a theme here. Yes, definitely a theme going on. What the Emperor does, he descends to send the Yasta Garasu to summon Shiki the Elder to him. I suppose the Divine Bird is now happy to act as messenger for the future Emperor. However, the Elder refuses his summons and even aims his bow at the Divine Creature before it flees to try and find Shiki the Younger. Again, when the Yatagarasu arrives, he asks the Younger Brother to answer the summons of Emperor Jimu. The younger brother does fortunately agree to this and after meeting the emperor decides to send the younger brother back with a message for his older brother. The message in essence being join us or die. At this time it's also said that the emperor was sending similar messages to other bandit groups in the area, in particular one led by Kuraji the elder and Kuraji the younger. So again the elder and younger dynamic seems to be going on here. So I don't know if you know that you probably don't know this show because it's really old and it's American TV show. But there was um, these three characters. I think was it Newhart? I think. And they there's one brother. He's like, my name is Daryl. This is my brother Daryl. This is my other brother Daryl. And they were all three named Daryl. And every time you mention this, I keep thinking about this is Daryl. This is my other brother Daryl. I have no idea what this show is. It's really old. I think I watched reruns. This is Kuraji and this is my other brother, Kuraji. Ah, oh, dear. Going on how the other elder acted in the previous instances of this, do you think he accepted the summons this time or do you think he continued to ignore the future emperor, Heather? Oh, he totally ignored. Of course he did. Mm -hmm. So the elder refuses one more time to change his mind and so... One of the emperor's men, Shihine Tsuhiko, decided to form a battle plan. He decided that they were going to send their weakest troops towards the 
the elder. And their reasoning was that the elder brother would then think the emperor is sending his best troops against me, so I better defend myself and send my best men also. They send the weakest men, they see that the elder brother is sending his strongest men. As that is happening, the emperor Jimu then sends his strongest men to circle around to the back of the opposing army, and they then crush the elder brother and his remaining army between their two forces as they attack from the front and the back. Isn't that like a pincher attack? Is it a pincher attack? Pincher or pincer? Maybe pincer is what I'm thinking of. Mm, I think so. It's quite a good tactic. Mm. I mean, obviously the man didn't see it coming and it did work out. After this, there was another battle because like I said, Upon the top of that mountain, he did see a lot of enemy armies that he was going to have to subdue. And this is where the emperor finds himself once again fighting the man known as Nagasune Hiko, the man from last week who killed the emperor's brother that I got mixed up and said died, but didn't actually die. And he's come back now. However, still, the emperor found that he could not defeat this man or his armies. He was trying desperately to figure out how he could finally defeat the man who killed his brother. And then it is said that suddenly the, the sky became overcast and hail began to fall in droves. And from above a wondrous bird, a kite with the color of gold, came to perch atop the emperor's bow. And that's actually where I'm going to leave it today, mm -hmm. on a bit of a cliffhanger. And we'll find out next week what happens in the ensuing battle. There are a few revelations that are going to happen, and then we'll finally work our way towards the end of Emperor Jimu's reign and his, his eventual death and burial. So, what do you think, Ever? Well, it's a little bit more, more uh, graphic than the first telling. Lots of, uh, lots of fighting and mm -hmm. other things that I'm not going to go back and say. And <laughs> drunk fish and crows with potentially... Uh, elongated features. Lots going on in this one. There's definitely a lot more activity and more conquering. A lot of conquering and lots of elders and yel yel yelders and yelders. <laughs> lots of elders. The yelders and, and yelders. Yeah, <laughs> elders and youngers. Yeah, there's definitely more conquering going on this time, which it took a while for them to get to this point because, mm. like we saw in last week's episode, they sp they would go somewhere and wait for eight years and nothing was really achieved it's only now they seem to actively be constantly battling people like clan after clan after clan to try and bring the to try and bling bling to try and bring <laughs> the entire area under his rule so there's definitely a much faster pace this time which is kind of why i also wanted to cut it shorter this week because i didn't mm. want there to be too an overload of information but yeah emperor jimu is finally getting stuff done, I suppose you could say. That's true, there was a lot of setup and moving about. Yeah, yeah, last week was definitely the setup. Today was definitely the the action, and next week will be the conclusion. Um, again, I think we were saying as well last week, the you were on about how it's very different to all the Shinto things. There's a lot less magical elements to it. Yeah, this is a little more mildly magical. So not everything. Yeah, a little bit here and there. Like you can still, you can still see how they're slowly trying to phase out the Shinto deity. Well, not completely phase out. We still know that they are descended from them, but they're trying to say now these stories are set in the real world in Japan, and so we're trying to separate the human. I don't know. Like we could say the human realm and the divine realm, perhaps. Hmm. Yeah, still, still slight elements of the say, mythological, elements of the fantastical, yeah, and elements of the fantastical and mythological, but not everything, which makes sense because he's not an actual god, he's descended from gods, correct? Yes. Or he's part, or I don't know, that, that, that's something, yeah, I know the, the emperor is, is, is considered, like, very sacred in japan so yes i mean i know that after world war ii i think i might have said it last week after yeah. world war ii america made them 
renounce the divine claim. Uh, but tr historically, yes, they were. They said the emperor was descended from a god. Uh, it would be. I might look into that for next week. Look at the family tree a bit closer and try and figure mm. out how much of a god he was. Mm. Um, because we do know at least. Well, we said the names of his parents, but I'm not sure if his dad was divine or not. But we do know that like, we said his mother was a dragon. So there's definitely half a god in him. So it's just, I suppose, checking how divine his father was to see how much of a god the first emperor actually was. I'm really interested to see how this concludes next week. And you said there's more, more things coming I was thinking that we would reach the conclusion very quickly, but I guess since you you did split it off here, it's a little bit longer than I would expect. So I'm looking forward to the next installment. Okay, I'm glad. But yes, I hope you, well, you said you enjoyed it. I do hope people at home enjoyed it this week. Uh, there was definitely a lot of stuff happening this week. So I hope it was, I hope I wasn't talking too quickly and it all made sense. But yeah, we will conclude this next week. This will be our first, I suppose, three-part episode, ABC. But that is me done for the day. And I do remember, Heather, I set you a bit of a challenge last week of a poet we have never had before. And also, you added to it not one from the 100 Poets book. So... I'm very interested to see who you came across because we know a lot of poets by now because we have our poetry books. Even if we haven't read the poems of them per se, we have come across their names by this point. So I'm looking forward to learning about someone I don't know about. Okay, so yes, Thomas, last week you gave me a challenge and then I one-upped myself. one up myself. I, I made the challenge a little more challenging by not picking a poem that was in the 100 book, 100 poets book. And I did not. I picked one from the how to read a Japanese poem book that I have. And I do have a little bit of history about the author, but I'm not going to tell you a lot. And you'll, you'll, you'll find out why I think in a little bit. Our poet today is Higuchi Ichio, who was born May 2nd, 1872. She was an author and a poet writing in the classical Japanese style. While she was more famous for her short stories, she wrote several poems as well. She wrote an anthology of poems titled Ichio's Waka Anthology, which contains well over 3,000 poems. And Thomas, I don't know, does that name ring any bells to you? You know, it does, because I feel we have mentioned her or I'm just trying to remember. I won't look up information on her on the internet, but it, can I do it? Because she's quite recent. Could I do a Google image search and maybe the picture will help me figure it out? I'll do you one better. Open your open your wallet and see if you have a 5,000 yen bill. Oh, 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 yes. Okay, then she is on. Yes, as soon as you said wallet. She's one of the people on the one on the 5,000 yen note. Ah, oh, we need to go back to that. We've done the 1,000 yen, but we haven't done the others yet. And that's why you, I, I guess that's why you don't want to go into her too much because we need to do her own episode. That's yeah, a sneaky was... little reminder. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, what's really funny is I found, I found this poem. And I'm like, oh, this is, this is really great. And I'm like, oh, I was super excited because it was, you know, it, we have a lot more men uh, poets than mm, we have we do. women poets. So I was really super happy and excited. I was like, I need more. I'd like to find more, uh, more women to, to talk mm. about in the podcast. So I got really excited, but then I was like, wait a minute, that name does seem familiar. And I couldn't really figure out why. And then I asked the professor and he was like, oh, of course I know her. And I was like, really? He's like, mm, yeah, she's on the 5,000 yen bill. And I, I did a little face palm and went, oh, that's <laughs> And then it's like, yeah, we haven't we haven't spoken about her yet. So, call back to, oh my gosh, a long time ago when we were doing the Sin and Bill. We definitely have to come back to the money series, and we've got to we've got to take care of that before they change the bills, which I think is coming in the next year or so. Yeah. So I did find a a poet we haven't done, as well as a person we haven't done. So, yay. 
Did I meet your challenge? You did meet the challenge. All right. So if you're ready, I shall read. I am not ready. I need, I need a pen. Okay, now I'm ready. Okay. Kasuga no ni. Moeizuru haru no. Wakakusa no. Hayaku mo hito o. Misometsuru kana. I heard haru. Oh, hmm. so, but is this the haru of spring? It is indeed. Okay. I heard hayaku. Mm -hmm. Was it, but I think I, was it hayaku no hito? Oh, hayaku mo hito o. Hayaku mo hito. Fast people? Well, definitely, definitely fast. And okay. specifically, it doesn't have a translation of hito in the translation. Okay. So they've interpreted it kind of differently. Apart from those two, I heard, I, I wrote down other Japanese lines from the poem, but I don't actually know what they mean. So just, just those few words today, for me, anyway. So I'm very intrigued about the translation. Well, the translation is, Ah, how swiftly the spring grasses have come out on Kasuga Moor. As swiftly as I have come to take notice of you. It sounds kind of like a love poem. Mm -hmm, yeah. Yeah, you're, you're spot I'm also on. wondering, we've talked about um, pillow words, where mm -hmm. they will use a place because it conjured a specific image. Is that applicable to the Kasuga Moor? So in, in the book I'm using, it. so the place name is, is in Nara. So, oh, look, we're tied into Nara. So oh, an it's themed. Theme. There we go. <laughs> it's not seasonally seasonally themed because it's fall right now, but or autumn. But yes, apparently the uh, grasses coming out, like in, in spring when all the grasses come back after the hibernation and dormancy of winter, it's the stirrings of first love. Oh, okay. So as spring, everything blooms again. New year, new growth. Yeah, new blooms. So new new stirrings in the heart hmm. but it also sounds like it's not a new love you could also apply to it sounds like what am i trying to say here how how swiftly i come to you like it could easily apply to someone you've also been with for a long time it doesn't necessarily sound like it's a new love i, I could see that interpretation but then i also think as swiftly as i have come to take notice of you it could be someone maybe you've known for a while, but you haven't been maybe interested in them romantically, possibly. And then suddenly you you have that moment where you suddenly see someone in a different light. And it's like, oh, I have feelings. As the cherry blossoms come out again, I do realize that I do like you, sir. I do. Pretty much that. <laughs> mm. As if this we're, we're going on, on grass since we're on Kasuga. It's definitely a sweet poem, though. And I do wonder if she based it off of something personal or something she noticed from someone else she knew? I could answer that, but I feel like once we have the podcast about her, you'll have some explanation for that. So I, I, I actually could answer oh, that. Oh, no. I, You're I know, making I, me wait. I, I read about her uh, just to do some research and background to see how much I wanted to talk about. And then I went, no, we have to we have to talk about her. She said it. She had an interesting life. She had a short life, but a very interesting one. So okay. oh, there's a lot we could talk about with her. So I would say possibly, oh, I can't answer it. <laughs> I could answer it, but I, I'm not. I, I'm not going to. You don't want to. You want me and everyone else to wait until we do a dedicated episode to her. I think she deserves a dedicated episode. Well, that was definitely our plan with the money. Hmm. So... She will definitely get one. Well, I suppose there's nothing left for me to say because you're not going to answer any of my questions, are you? I am I am mysterious. I'll have to find a myster mysterious uh, poem next week, maybe. Another mystery poem. A mystery poem. Perhaps you will. So thank you for the poem then, Heather. I guess I will have to wait patiently for the episode. But until then, thank you so much for it. You are very welcome. So yeah, I just want to sign out, I suppose. Then thank you everyone for tuning in again this week. Uh, I'm so happy we're back properly now every week doing this. It's It was definitely missing from my life. It's a good distraction and a good stress reliever working on projects like this, especially with you, Heather. So again, thank you for agreeing to do this with me when I first started. 
So yeah, guys, I think you know the drill by now. If you want to follow us on Facebook or Twitter, that is at Japan Archives. If you want to see some of the places I've been traveling around to in Japan, you can follow me on Nexus Travels. That's N-E-X-U-S underscore travels. And again, the show notes will be up when this podcast gets uploaded on Wednesday morning, Japan time, because it is nighttime now on Tuesday, and I would like to go to bed. But that is everything from me. How about you, Heather? I, th- I think that's 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 it for me as well. I can't think of anything to add at this point. Well, until next week then, guys. Yeah. Matane. Mina san kyosukete. Matane.